You are listening to the Novice No Longer podcast, episode number 32. This week, we are talking to Dan Council of Real Mac Software. Welcome to the Novice No Longer podcast, where top app developers help you build and market your apps. I'm Dan Berg, former tech journalist turned entrepreneur and app developer. Each week, I talk to the creators of some of the top apps in the App Store to unlock the secrets of app success. Thanks for listening, and let's get started. Hello again, this is Dan, of course, with the Novice No Longer podcast. Hope you had a good week. Thank you so much for tuning in again, and I am absolutely honored with the guest that we have on today. It is Dan Council. He is known as the guy that created and founded Real Mac Software, which has been around for a while, has a bunch of apps, including my favorite app, possibly my favorite app of all time. I use this app every single day on both my iPhone and my Mac. It's called Clear. It's a to-do list manager, but it's the most basic but beautiful to-do list manager ever because I used to use OmniFocus, which is a very much a getting things done, like really advanced kind of to-do application where you add context, you add all the different features. It's kind of like a project management software for yourself. Clear is the exact opposite of that. In fact, it just blew everybody in the app store away when it was first released because it was so different because it it didn't have a bunch of like buttons or skeuomorphism or anything. It was just really minimalistic. It was very colorful and it was an entirely gesture-based interface, which was brand new at the time and just it took everybody by surprise, and it, it was just a really amazing piece of software, and I've personally been using it ever since. So I'm really excited because I got Dan on the show, and we had a great conversation. He shared how he got started with software, um, from starting with web development into software development, and then we go into talking about the creation of a new application and what the process is like for him and for Real Mac software, as well as what the launch process is like and how early he gets started and what kind of work that he does. And there's a lot of great information here. And he has his own personal blog too, dancouncil.com, which I have in the show notes that he shares a bunch of amazing information. But before we jump into that, I just want to jump in and thank you guys for listening. And on that note, I'm going to share a review, a really nice one that somebody left for me today. So this one says, plug in your headphones and keep listening to all the amazing advice and stories from people who did it. Dan is amazing at what he does, and I would recommend this podcast to anyone. And that was written by somebody named Spicy Tack. I like that, Spicy Tack. Uh, so Spicy Tack, thank you so much for those kind words. I'm, I'm so happy that you guys like that I find all these people to talk to because I'm having a blast. I get to talk to these people, and I'm glad that you like to like listening to it as well. That makes me very happy. So without further ado, let's jump right into the interview here with Dan Council because so much good information. I had a blast. Enjoy. Hey, everybody. This is Dan with Novice No Longer, and I am here with another Dan. This is Dan Council of Real Mac Software. He created Ember, Clear for iOS and Mac, and Rapid Weaver, and I'm very excited to have him with us today. So, hey, Dan, how's it going? Thanks for being here. It's, uh, it's going good, thanks. Um, thanks for having me on the show. Um, and I, I honestly hope your uh, listeners find my ramblings of some use. <laughs> I'm, I'm definitely sure they will. Um, I know <laughs> I at least, I use Clear every day. That, that's my to-do list application. I got so many lists. I have it for my Mac and my phone and they sync. And, and so I just want to start off and say thank you for that. Um, and I'm, I'm sure that this conversation, we've been talking a little bit before for everybody listening, and I think it's going to be really fantastic. So I'm excited. That's, that's awesome to, to hear uh, you use Clear every day. That's, uh, it, it's always very satisfying when um, you know, people tell you they use your products and, and they find them useful. I mean, because that is really um, you know, why, why, why I do what I do. Exactly. That, that's the goal, <laughs> to be able to uh, either see a problem that exists out there and solve it or to have a problem yourself, create something to solve that problem in yourself and then see that you're not alone and other people have it. It's just a, it's an amazing feeling. Yeah, exactly. So I, I kind of want to start this off by kind of delving into your past and your history. I know it's kind of long because RealMac software, that's been around for like 12 years or so. So there's a lot of stuff, but I kind of want to start off just at the very beginning about how did you get into software development and programming and design? Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, so 
I've always been interested in design and tinkering with computers, you know, from a, from a, from a pretty young age. Um, I kind of grew up with the Atari ST, um, if you remember that. And then um, I was very fortunate enough, you know, my dad uh, brought home like a um, Mac Classic and I've used Macs ever since then. Um, so, yeah, so uh, I, I went to um, uni to study graphic design and illustration. It was a two-year course um, and it, it was great. But after a year, I kind of, they didn't, it, they didn't do enough of the technical side of things. It was very, um, it was more on the painting side and the, the color theory. And, and I really wanted to get, you know, I really wanted to be using computers cause that was, you know, that's, I loved just spending time. Like I used to spend time at home on, on, uh, on the Mac and, you know, tinkering about. And I, and that's where my real passion was. So after a year, um, I quit the course much to my, um, parents dismay. They were not, not too impressed. Um, <laughs> with that. yeah. Um, and you know, and luckily, um, I managed to get a job up in London, uh, doing, uh, photo retouching. Um, because, you know, that was, I'd been doing that on the, on the Mac kind of playing around with photos and I was very fortunate, um, that I managed to get a job doing that. And I, I did that for a couple of years, but while I was there, I got more and more interested in, uh, building websites and playing around with that side of the thing, that side of things. And previously I'd, I'd not done kind of not really touched programming in any form. Um, I'd played around with HyperCard, which is an old kind of programming language on the Mac, um, but I'd never really done anything. And, and the web is a very easy way to kind of get into programming and that, or that kind of, to think about code and how it works. And, and that was kind of the easiest path. So I was thinking around with websites on the side. So when you say this, um, is this like HTML, CSS, mm-hmm. JavaScript type stuff? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Really, really simple stuff, you know, like building, I was, I was building, you know, a personal website at the time, that kind of thing, playing mm-hmm. around. Um, and it, I know it's very, it's easy to do now, but um, if you've never had any experience in doing it, it it, it can seem a lot But um, to, to kind of get into it. But, uh, you know, I, I think you, with those things, you need to stick with it. And and as long as you enjoy it, you know, it's great. You should you should go for it and tinker around and, and um, yeah. So, so, yeah, so I was very much kind of playing around with that side of things. And, and, it, and I was really, really interested in it. It kind of, kind of took over, what I, and that's what I wanted to be doing rather than retouching photos. Um, and I managed to get a job doing, um, like, a, a web agency, doing web design um, and also their branding side of things. Um, so I was very fortunate um, that they took me on. And, you know, I wasn't amazing, um, but I was good enough. And and I was there for around two years. And during that time, um, I obviously got a lot better and very proficient. And and that kind of led me, while I was there, I started wondering, oh, you know, if I'm building these websites and playing around with JavaScript, I wonder how Mac apps are built. I wonder if I could build, because, you know, you would see these apps and I'd download them, or software, as <laughs> it was more commonly called back yep. then. And I wondered how they were built. So I kind of started looking into that. And there was this, uh, back then there was this program called Real Basic, which allowed you to to build Mac apps. Um, and, and it was pretty complex, but I could kind of get started with it. Um, so, so yeah, so during that time, like those two years when I was, uh, doing web design as a full-time job, I started trying to build apps on the side and it was around 2001, I released my first app, well, or piece of software, um, mm-hmm. called, it was called Acromatic. Um, and this was back in 2001 and it was a really simple program that allowed people to build nice buttons for their website so graphical buttons which before you know you would have needed to to do in photoshop so it was a nice so it was a nice easy way for people to do that and i put it up on my personal site and said you know download it try it and if you like it then you can i think it was like ten dollars back then it's Um, like a freeware thing yeah yeah and I, I didn't expect, I put it out there, didn't expect anything. And the, the following, I think it was like the following day, 
these orders started coming in. Like I, the, I got one and it was like, what? Someone sent me some money. Like they liked <laughs> this program. It was, yeah. It's an absolutely incredible feeling when, you know, someone uses something, they value it enough to, to kind of give you money for it. And that was, that was mind blowing. And fortunately people seemed to like the app and, you know, more and more orders were coming in and it was just, you know, I, I phoned up uh, my wife at the time and I was like, this is amazing. Like people are, people are sending, you know, they're sending me money. This is incredible. I didn't, you know, cause I was never really, I thought I may as well say, you know, do you want to, uh, give me some money for the app and just see what happened. And, mm-hmm. and, you know, and it was, and it was crazy and, um, people did. And that really, I guess that was the point where it really made me think, huh, maybe, you know, if I carry on doing this and it, I could turn it into something. Um, and it was, it was about a year before things built up and I was, the money I was making from selling software on the side actually matched my salary and at that time, I kind of took the leap and said, you know what, I'll quit my job. And I, if I do this full time, perhaps I can, you know, I can spend, well, I can spend even more time on doing this and, and I can, you know, earn even more revenue and, and try and, you know, build, build, a, build a company out of it. Um, so that was, that was around 2002 that happened. And, and that's when I started RealMac Software full time. But, it, you know, even then it was it was in my spare bedroom at the, at the time. So, um, that's amazing. Now during that time, the year that you were working, um, both your full-time job and then doing software on the side, did you have more than that one application or did you create another one during that time that they they slowly grew to match your other jobs uh, salary? Um, I mainly worked on, um, just that one app, um, and released, you know, big updates to it because, because it was my first app, I I released it out there and, and obviously had a ton of feedback and people saying, Oh, you should add this and we want this. And, and that took up a lot of my time and, and, um, and yeah, and, and it, because I added the the features people were requesting, obviously became more popular. Um, and yeah, so for, for, I mean, for the, for the first year or so it was, it was just that app, but then I started branching out and, and, you know, looking at building other things. And, and I think it was, you know, a few years in, I suddenly had three or four products. Um, awesome. Now, for those products, were they things that you needed yourself so you built them? Or was it things that you saw around that people were asking for? Was it feedback that people were giving you from existing apps you kind of spun off to new apps? How did you get the, the inspiration for what to build? Um, yeah, I think a, a lot of it was what I thought would be useful that I saw myself doing. I mean, that's definitely the, uh, going back to Acromatic, the built the buttons, that was definitely, I mean, that was a thing at the time because around then OS 10 had just shipped and um, that, you know, the first version of OS 10 and people were going crazy over the Aqua style buttons and they were very hard to recreate in Photoshop. Um, so to have an application that did that easily, you know, I think that's obviously why it took off because it saved people from having to go into Photoshop and try and recreate the look of it. Because around that time, people were going crazy for it. And so many websites suddenly had all these Aqua style buttons on them. Uh-huh. It, I mean, it's, it's, it still happens today, you know, where Apple releases something and, and a lot of people kind of follow that trend. And um, it's been happening for years. Um, so yeah, a lot, a lot of it was based on, what I saw a need for and, and what I would f- find useful. I mean, the next, one of the next apps um, we built uh, was an app called Navbar Builder, which essentially built website navigation for you. Um, because back then that was, that was pretty, pretty hard to do as well. So it generated all the HTML and CSS um, for, for people. So, you know, you could get a website up and running quickly. And Navbar Builder is actually what became um, rapid weaver, which is an app we still maintain and sell today. So that's, you know, that was around six or seven years ago, maybe longer now, eight years, maybe, um, that it actually turned into, into rapid weaver, which, which now that's a, that's our, um, for those people that don't know, rapid weaver is our, uh, Mac, um, uh, web creation software. So you can, create a fully blown website kind of drag and drop style and you don't need to know any coding um yeah super handy and it's cool because these applications were you were working in web development Mm -hmm. and 
you saw the landscape. You saw that OS X just came out, and you saw that everybody's trying to do this. You're trying to do it yourself, and you're struggling. So you just create a tool that makes it easier. And, and it sounds like both with the the button application and this other like you're seeing the need because you have it yourself and you're creating it and people are just they're so happy to have it easier yeah i think that's one of the um one of the main things we've noticed again and again with building software um when when there's a need for it and it helps it helps people and it makes their lives easier or, or get a job done quicker it that's value for them um, which is which is very different. This is I think this is why a lot of social applications struggle because people don't really need them. You know, mm-hmm. it's not, and they don't want to pay for them because it do, it doesn't. It's not like it helps them get a job done. Um, whereas something like a, a to do list actually helps people organize organize their lives and it can improve their life. And so I think when you build something like that, that, that helps people, they are actually, if it's good enough, people are willing to, to put money down and, and, you know, and, and buy, buy it. Yeah. And this is a perfect transition because I do want to jump ahead a little bit Mm. to talk more about clear the iOS app, which is, it's a to-do list application for anybody that hasn't seen it. You, you should really like go Google this. I'll put it in the show notes because the thing that makes clear stand apart is its design, which is just beautiful it, it uses gesture based colorful it's really nice so definitely take a look so you have some context for this but you're talking about use and and there being a need to for utilities versus like social networks for apps and things so i, I was curious when you looked at the app store and you saw a bunch of to-do list applications what made you think that there was space for another one like clear that you would create. I guess that's down to the, the it, it's kind of, it's a bit of a curse when, when you're so used to building products and you look at, you use other products and you always think, Oh, I could build this better. You know, I would, it needs to have this or it shouldn't have this or that's, you know, that UI is too cluttered. Um, so we've always, uh, I've always suffered a bit with that. It's so, it's hard to know what to build next. And, and you, you know, because it's, you always think you could build something better or improve on something. And the to-do list area, especially on the iPhone at the time, we were, all the stuff I'd used, none of it was felt quite right. It was, they had a lot of options and they were very, they were overly complex. And, you know, it was, I just want a clean to-do list where you can actually see, your tasks and you don't have to worry about setting dates and you know due dates and tags and putting them in folders and you know because that all takes time and it's complexity most people don't need and we were saying wouldn't it be great just to build something so simple um yeah that that anyone can use um yeah so you had the idea for uh a to-do list it was simple it didn't exist in the app store what how did the process start for you? Do you start like sitting down with a sketch pad and sketch out what it's going to do and then do the, the design phase or, or what's kind of like step one once you mm. have this concept in your head? Sure. Um, I mean, it varies, but it's usually like you say, it, it kind of starts with a rough idea um, in your head and you think, wouldn't it be great to build this? And we definitely s- sketch things out um, kind of, it's good to write down what features you think it's going to have. And it's often, it has a million features, you know, cause you want to get everything in there. You want it to do this and it should do this. And, um, we, we often start, start with that. Um, and, and after that, it, it's kind of refining it. We obviously talk about it at team as a, as a team now when we have ideas and, and what the product should do and how it should look. Um, but, but, you know, after talking about the feature set, we often do rough mock-ups. So there'll be, we'll definitely start with some very rough sketches to kind of get an idea for the, for the UI of how the rough flow of how it should look and work. And once we have this kind of rough picture, it's then that we'll, kind of go in and, and mock it up in Photoshop and, um, and, you know, and really refine it. And then we can look at what features it needs and, and exactly how, how, how things will work. 
Awesome. So you basically write down like all of the features, what you want it to do, mm-hmm. and then you kind of start doing very, very rough kind of initial mock-ups to get an idea yeah. for it. Now, one of the one of my favorite things about Clear is that it is gesture-based. You swipe to the right in order to mark something is done. You swipe up to clear your done-to-do items. Mm-hmm. You can pinch to close lists. When did you like when did that idea start because that's kind of risky not a lot of apps rely on gestures so much simply because people can't always guess what they are you have to kind of train people so what made you decide that gestures was the way that you wanted to go and what were some of the concerns that you had well i think we we went that route um purely because every like i said before all the other to-do lists were so complex and we wanted to try and get rid of as much ui clutter as possible and boil it down to literally just your list on screen you know make it as close to having a pen and paper list as possible but with the benefits of it being you know an app um so we i mean it it is a concern and it was a concern when when we launched it that perhaps some people would find it hard to use and and i mean there were some people you know we had complaints but we had more people enjoyed the way it worked. And once I think it's one of those things, once you learn the way it works, it's very satisfying to use. Oh, it's so natural now. I don't even think about it. Yeah. You were able to nail exactly what each gesture did. I, I, it seems it feels natural. It's, it's strange. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it was a bit of a, a process and it, and it was, um, fairly hairy at times and I, and I remember in the office we were we were talking about it and people had very strong opinions and and it was like oh it, it can't do that you know we've got to we've got to put a button in there how are people going to know how to use this and um and I mean in the end we we settled on having um a tutorial kind of upfront card showing people giving people the basics of how to get started. But I think that's one of the the charms of um, gestural driven apps is that, you know, you can play around with them. And and especially if you start using an app, you just kind of play around and you see what happens. And, and now I think it's uh, because this was around 2011. So it was, it wasn't particularly common then that apps were so gesturally driven. Um, It's a bit different now, you know, you're used to playing around with apps and seeing if you know if you swipe at the side if there's any gestures and things and that's and that's very common especially because of uh, ios 7 it's definitely people are a lot more used to that now yeah, and then you have something crazy like the amazon phone which you kind of flip it to the side nice. and menus come up it's ridiculous <laughs> yes yeah yeah I'm, I'm, yeah that hasn't had uh, particularly good reviews that one yeah uh, but, i have not yeah. played with it personally but just looking at that i, I can't really see it but okay anyway yeah I, that's, that's that's too far I think they've made <laughs> exactly a little bit too step. far in the wrong direction mm-hmm. um so i want to get into the launch of clear because the way that i knew about clear and i found out about it is i just saw it everywhere and the reviews were just great people were like it's a fantastic minimalist to do app and i'm like i have to try it out so i guess going back to tar- stock excuse me talking about the process when did your prep mm. for the launch start for Clear? Like, how long in advance do you get things going? It, um, I mean, we've, the, the funny thing is, uh, with every, every time we launch something, we learn from it. Um, and we, I mean, we learned a ton by launching Clear because that was our first iOS app. Um, I, I think a lot of it had to do, it was the right app at the right time. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's there's been some other amazing apps on iOS that just that are absolutely incredible, but they just for some reason the press don't pick up on them and they just don't click with people. They just and I think that's one of the key things, and, it, and it's by chance or luck that your app is released at the right time. Um, and I think we were very we were very lucky with Clear because it was it was fairly early on, and and there weren't because it had a custom UI there. Were, at the time, most UIs were very skeuomorphic and textured and had buttons and things like that. So Clear very much stood out. So when, um, I mean, we, we uh, going back to your original question about how long do we, do we plan for the launch, I, you, you really, you can't start too early planning for a launch of an app um, because there, there is so much to do and there, there's, 
you need to let the press know about it as early as possible and kind of make those contacts. If you wait until your app has shipped or is ready to ship and then you start telling the press about it, it's kind of too late. Um, so you really, I would, I would say at least start prepping a month before. Um, and in Clear's case, I think we released the video around two weeks before the launch. And that's really... If we didn't have the video, I think it wouldn't have had as much interest. It was the video that really people can see how it works and they were the gestural UI, you know, and, and they were obviously that got people excited and about using the app. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, I think the, the uh, promo videos really helped. I think if we hadn't have had that, we wouldn't have had as much coverage um, as, as we did. Now, when you say that, uh, the, one of the things you should do is kind of have these relationships with the press. So you're mm-hmm. not like emailing them when after it's released or like the day of is kind of too late. Or do you tell them that you're creating uh, an app? You're like, hey, I'm working on this. Just want to give you a heads up. Or, or what sort of initial contact should you have with the, these potential journalists or the journalists that are potentially might cover your application? I mean, a, a great um, a great thing to do is is to obviously go out and look at the sites you would like to be covered on, and um, look for look at the articles written on that site, and find the journalists who have who are writing those articles that are similar to perhaps they're writing about similar things um, to to your apps, so they're in the kind of same space, you know. And um, if you've got a photography app, go and look for people journalists that are writing about who are, or have written in the past about photography apps. Um, so you really, um, it sounds a bit stalkerish, but I find like Twitter is, is great for following um, journalists and, and, um, and new sites and stuff just to kind of get to know them. And, and, and that's a very easy way to, to kind of join in a conversation with them and say, Hey, Hi, you know, on Twitter, rather than emailing them out of the blue, um, I find it's because then, you know, maybe if you've spoken with them on Twitter a couple of times, you know, maybe they'll they'll just remember that, oh, you know, they, they helped me out on Twitter. They said something and, and that's enough to kind of rather than just throwing that press release in, in the in the trash, you know, maybe it's enough to just say mm, that name sounds familiar and. And kind of that can sometimes be all you need to, to you know, get your, your foot in the door almost, as it were, to kind of spark their interest. Yeah, and I can totally, uh, as somebody that used to work as a journalist, say that that's 100% true. Um, and, and it's mm. funny to me because people that write online, like journalists, they're always really active on Twitter. They have, like, Twitter accounts where mm. they share things all the time. They're very active there. So as somebody who creates software, is promoting an application, finding the people who have like you in their beats so you're what they write about and then just yeah. following them on twitter and interacting not being like hey let's look at this look at this but just being mm. real with them and uh using that contextual interaction to then pitch on a later date that, that's fantastic advice uh, yeah definitely yeah i think you need to be uh, just be very honest and be yourself don't i think that's one of the key things you don't want to if you come across as fake or you're just, you know, following them because you want them to cover your product, that's very fake. You know, um, over the years, because we've been doing this for so long, you know, you, you, especially if you go to, um, to WWDC and, um, and conferences, you kind of, you start meeting the press and, and they can actually become good friends. You know, you can build up good relationships with them. And the thing is the, the press and journalists, they do get, a, a lot of people obviously wanting um, wanting them to cover their apps, but they also need news. You know, it's not if if they didn't have anyone contact them, they'd have nothing to write about. So I think one of the one of the key things is to make sure your story is interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, that's so true. So true. Yeah, the, you know, because it's there's so many apps get released and it's the same, you know, oh, this app does X, but th- that's not, that's not very interesting. There needs to be, there's got to be some reason why it stands out. Maybe there's an interesting um, history to the app um, or, you know, maybe your app is completely different because of, 
because of the way it looks and stuff like that. So there's, there's, there's often, if you think about it and you look deeply, there is, everyone has an interesting story. Um, and that's really what journalists are looking for because they don't want to just cover another photography app, for example, because, you know, there, there's hundreds, there's thousands of those. Um, if there's a story behind them, if there's an angle on it, then you're much more likely to get it covered. Oh, yeah. And, and the thing that I always say and that I tell people, especially from just receiving so many, so many pitches, is the fact that you exist is not news. Like, you have to do something. No. Or, like, you're launching, you're releasing a feature, you're responding to some news article, you're, you're doing something. But I would get so many pitches, it was like, hey, you just wrote about fitness trackers. I'm a fitness tracker, too. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> that it's not news then. So, yeah, that like... Mm find some way to tell a story, make it relevant. And, and that's the best way to ensure a higher response rate. Yeah. Yeah. I there was, um, I can't remember the name of the app. I, 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 I want to say uh, maybe Sumley. I don't know the, the, the guy behind that or the kid, I think he was very young. Got acquired and, by you Yahoo. Know, that was, Yes. 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 So that, that that was his angle, you know, that he's he's so young, and that's that's interesting for people. Um, so, you know, obviously not everyone has such a story, but uh, there is often, you know, you can. There is often something there if you, if you actually look look deeper and, and think about it. Um, everyone has a has a story. Yeah, and that guy that created Sumley pitched everyone. He was so prolific about it. And he has a great success story because mm. it was it was bought by Yahoo and turned right now it turned into the Yahoo News Digest, which I read every day, twice a day, which is a fantastic little news uh, application. And it's funny because I tweeted about enjoying yahoo news digest and he responded and i was like that's awesome so yeah on point right yeah. there that's a good example <laughs> so you're building these relationships with journalists you created a video that shows the application in use and you did that about two weeks early was there anything else that you did to kind of build up to the launch did you have like an email list or did you when you pitch people like give a certain date embargoes like what what was your launch like yeah, the um, you mentioned email list, which we have found that has been increasingly important. Um, everyone, everyone kind of jumps on Twitter and Facebook saying, you know, you need to build up a big following there, and you know, get people following your app. But really, we found email is by far and away the best way to uh, promote your app to get people to sign up to that list. So. Um, with the clear launch, we had the video on the site and then a sign-up form saying, you know, if you want to know when it's released, put your email address in here and we'll let you know as soon as it's available. And that was incredible. You know, we because the because the, it had so much interest, we had around 20,000 people sign up. And that really, really, really helps with a launch because when you come to launch an app you want to let as many people know as possible and not just the press but normal people so they can go out and buy it on day one and this is so critical on ios because you need you need that volume to drive you up the charts to to actually you know get in the top charts so people see your app and you're and you're not you know languishing down below you know in in the charts that they're kind of well, you're not even listed. I think is it the top couple of hundred they list, mm -hmm. maybe. So you know, you really need you really need to drive yourself up the charts because once you're up there, then it, it's a kind of a snowball effect. You know, people just happen to be browsing and see it and think, oh, that's a new app. Why is that up there? That must be interesting. And and that's really key to for a successful launch um, is to, you know to to get as many people on day one as possible to know about it and to go and buy it exactly or download it if it's a free app yeah because when when you're new there's a few ways that you can get noticed and the first is um like getting featured by apple well, the review team will see you or they know you as a developer and they're like okay and then you're going to be in the featured list and then there's also like the top apps which is like the top paid and the top free and apple can feature you and that gives you a ton of applications but being in like new and noteworthy and being in the top list all has to do with your download numbers and your the amount of your views yeah. and high reviews and that's 
like what your goal is with the launch. So when you're saying like you have this whole list and get them to download it and do it on the same day, because that'll spike your numbers and just drive you to the top, which just increases so much visibility. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, we, that we built up that email list and then on the day it was released, uh, we obviously emailed round, we sent out a mail shot and said, you know, it's available now, go and download it. Um, so that's, that's what we did on the, on the public side, on the press side of things. We, we started once we had a fairly stable beta build, we we started contacting them and saying, we're developing this app. Do you want to have a look at it? It's currently in beta, but we'd love some feedback. You know, what are you looking for in a to-do app? We want to make this the most perfect to-do app, and we'd love your feedback. Um, and we found that that opened up a lot of doors for us because, you know, journalists are, everyone uses to-do lists, and uh, to have that direct contact with a developer and be able to feed back into shaping the product um, you know, uh, a lot, you know, not every journalist, but a lot of them were interested in that and gave us some great feedback and were, and loved it and were on board from day one. And they had been using the beaters. So they were already, by the time it, they knew when it was going to launch. So, and they'd been using it for a while. So, you know, we had, um, a lot of press lined up on day one who had said, yeah, we, you know, we'll write articles about it. We'll write a review about it. And that helped, um, phenomenally with with the launch were you worried that any part of it was going to be leaked early or was that not a concern uh no no i i mean if you i i don't think we've ever had um press ever leak anything early i think they're they're very they're very good you know they know when things um especially the better sites they know when things are should be public and you know when they're not um i think people are people are far too pre- protective of their ideas sometimes and you know and they don't want to show people but i've found time and time again it's when you show people products that are currently being developed you get the best feedback because by the time you've launched it it's often too late so to actually open up a little bit and and ask for feedback from from peers and for from journalists and things is is invaluable yeah and they feel like they're a part of it too like you said so that just only adds to it yeah so definitely don't um don't wait until you've launched the app because that's what so many people do. They launch the app and then they send out a press release to all the press and then wonder why no one reviews it because, I mean, by that point, it's old news because it's already re- released. Mm-hmm. And there's the press, you know, there's, there's thousands of apps get released every week. And and the day you release it, you know, it's kind of already old. It's it's the press want to cover it just before it's launched or just as it launches. So, um, contacting the press once it's launched is, is, you know, the worst thing you can do. Oh yeah. That goes back to being the simple fact that you exist. Isn't news. Like if you're launching, Mm. that's news. You're like, Hey, I'm going to be launching. But if it's like, Hey, I'm already available. Everybody else has already written about me. You should too. You're like, yeah, no, not interested. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Exactly. (laughs) Uh, so I kind of want to touch, uh, after the release of the iOS app, a little bit later you came out with the Mac application, which is the companion. Mm-hmm. Was that always part of the initial vision, or did that come out of feedback, or, or how did that come into being? Yeah, that was, uh, I mean, we released it on the iPhone first, and it's very much, we'll see how it does, because obviously there's no one's interested, then there's kind of no point in continuing that and building a mac version um and you know thankfully people liked it and and they were requesting a mac version and that was always in our with all of our products is always in our our roadmap you know that we'll build it out for other platforms um within within the apple ecosystem i mean we only write stuff for mac and ios so it was very much if it does well um we'll we'll build it for the mac because it's we use it ourselves and it's something it's something we all wanted we found every day you know we we sit at our Macs all day long working and it just it felt one of those things we really wanted um and thankfully you know it was it's obviously vi- it was viable to build it if no one would have been interested in clear for ios then it would have been a hard decision because it's kind of although we wanted it on the mac it would have been you know if it didn't do very well then probably people aren't going to be interested on the mac either so um 
we very much we start with one platform and if it does well then we'll we'll build it out for other platforms Mm -hmm. that makes sense cool one of the one of the last things i kind of wanted to touch on was the pricing model for clear because it's a little Mm. bit more expensive than other apps in the app store um so how did you come to that decision versus all the other kind of payment models that exist in the app store (laughs) Clear has been the, the price has fluctuated over over the years since its introduction. Um, when we launched, I think we we went with the uh, ninety nine cents. Um, but uh, I think yeah, the iOS market, the, the paid market, um, has has kind of dropped a little bit. I would say um, so. We've we've found that just over time. Uh, raising the price has helped. So it's currently um, $5. And we, we, ch- we changed the price when we introduced the universal version of Clear. So, I mean, you do get the, you know, the complete iOS version. So you get it on an iPhone and iPad and for, for $5, um, which I know is still more expensive than some other apps. It's, it's, it's incredible that people we do get the occasional complaint that people say, Oh, that's too much. But we, we found pricing at 99 cents or one ninety nine. It's just the revenue coming in isn't enough and we get less downloads, but we actually revenue wise, we actually make more by having it at this price point. Mm-hmm. And it's all about finding that, um, sweet, the, the, yeah. finding that sweet spot. Yeah. I mean, we've, played with freemium for other apps before we played around with that and the thing going freemium like a lot of people look at that and think yes that's probably what all the games are doing that's what i should be doing i should go freemium but for freemium to work you need to have an incredible amount of users you know you need to have millions and millions of users and being and acquire new users all the time for for freemium to really work so we've We've played around with that and we found the results were, were pretty bad. Um, and clear right now, you know, it's, it's a paid app, but there's also in-app purchases within that. And we, you know, we found that to be pretty sustainable um, at the moment. So I would, I would advise people who are a little bit cautious if they're thinking about going freemium, especially with games. You know, I, people think that's kind of the, the, the answer is to go freemium, but because you hear of all the success stories, but you know, that's, it's the top percent of the app store, you know, the top couple of percent, they're, they're kind of making all the revenue on freemium because they have millions and millions of players, but everyone else um, doesn't. So, you know, it's, it's very, I think it's very hard to get a decent income. Yeah. And, and you wrote a fantastic article on pricing on your personal blog that I will link to in the show mm-hmm. notes for anybody listening. Definitely check that out and the other stuff that you've written about there. Um, so to kind of, yeah. I, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I, I just um, obviously every a lot of people are very interested in building iOS apps, but I I would say I wouldn't. A lot of people don't think about building uh, Mac apps, but the um, we find like a lot of our Mac Mac apps are even more uh, profitable than the iOS counterparts, um, purely because of the higher price points and people often come to their Mac to, to do work, you know, to get stuff done. So if you've got an app that's useful and can help people get work done, then, you know, they're willing to spend money on it to help them. Um, whereas iOS, you know, people want apps for free. So it is, I wouldn't write the Mac off. I would consider that when you, when you're looking at building apps or, you know, if you're looking at trying to build a company, writing apps, don't, um, actually do think about the Mac as well that's so interesting that that's an amazing insight now based on that i kind of want to ask you about your opinion on the app store on the Mm. mac and whether you've seen that be like a positive impact on the software industry or or what are your thoughts yeah i think i think it has um the mac app store is great for for new users um, and it's a great place to find software and i think it's also been great for I know it's helped us out as a company. It's been great for developers as well um, because now we, we sell our software directly on the Mac as well as via the Mac App Store, and they're essentially two different customer bases. Um, 
so it kind of doubles your revenue. It's, it's two different stores. You know, some people just never look on the, on the Mac App Store and they kind of find their software by Googling and stuff like that and just don't think to look on the Mac App Store. So by only selling software there, you're kind of missing out on half the market. Um, and we've definitely seen that. So I would, yeah, I, it's, the Mac App Store is a good thing, but don't just go Mac App Store only if you are going to build a Mac app. Sell it outside of the Mac App Store also. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. That's awesome. Um, so I kind of wanted to wind this up with a question uh, that the listeners might have. So if somebody listening just has an idea for an app, but nothing else, what would you tell them to do first? Like what, what would the first action they could take like right now that could help them? I would definitely work on um, scoping it out, writing down the features you think it should have and, and go ahead and start sketching out how you think it would look you know it doesn't it doesn't matter if you're if you know, ha- haven't had any training on how to do this or you know you're you're not from a design background um we use our our iphones all day you know every day and you know how apps look and it's a great place to start by sketching things out and getting your ideas down um and there's some, you know, there's some easy to use prototyping tools out there that there's, I think there's one, um, there's one on the iPhone, I think it was called Pop, where you can actually take photos of, um, of your, of your sketches and kind of build them into a working mock-up. Yeah. Um, that, and, you know, that's, that's awesome. I, yeah. Prototype it, prototyping on paper. It's Pop. It's awesome. I'll, I'll link to it in the show yes. notes. Yeah. I think that's a great way to start. And then once you've got that and you, you know, you can start showing that to friends and family and kind of see what they think, whether they think it would be a good app, whether they could see themselves using it. Um, and I think that's a great, it's a very easy way to validate the idea and, you know, see, see what people think of it. Awesome. I, I think that that's all valuable, actionable data. And I would give the exact same advice. Uh, Dan, it has been fantastic having you on the show. I think this has been uh, an full of information, so full of valuable information. So thank you for being here. Uh, no, it's been, it's been great. We'll um, definitely have to do it again sometime. Yeah, definitely. And if anybody listening wants to find what you're working on or contact you, how can they do that? Um, go to RealMac Software, which is my company website. That's www.realmacsoftware.com. Um, and if you want to learn more about app marketing um, and designing and building apps, I have a personal blog, um, and the address is www.dancouncil.com. So go and check that out as well. Yeah, and as I was saying, you have some amazing resources there from like how to make your video, how to make a landing page, like all this stuff. Like it's there. Definitely, listeners, check that out. Um, and to find me more, it's novicenolonger.com. You can go there for the show notes, uh, find out all the other episodes. And uh, Dan, thanks again for being here. Thanks. It's been great. Well, guys, it is that time again. We have reached the end of another episode. Now, if you've enjoyed this, please do me a favor. Share it with your friends. Write a review. Rate it on uh, iTunes in the App Store. All of those things really help me out because the only way that I can keep doing this and keep getting these guests that are just absolutely amazing like Dan Council and really get to keep putting out the podcast is by having more listeners and letting this grow. And so sending an email to a friend, posting on social media so they find it helps me get new listeners and maybe even better, leaving a review on iTunes, on Stitcher, anywhere you can really helps because those podcast directories are going to see that people are listening they're going to see that people are leaving reviews and then push me up farther and then more people can discover because i believe itunes is these the top podcast discovery place just bar none and stitcher is also huge i'm sure some of you are listening via stitcher so please go on there and do it and we're going to kick things off just like the last few episodes, and that's with the challenge to you. Now, I always say make one small step towards your app. Now, what I mean is people often get overwhelmed because there's so much work in building an app that they just freeze. They don't do anything. So what I want you to do is just figure out one step. That could be writing one email. It could be sketching out one screen on your app. On your app. Whatever it is, that one action, just do that. 
do that one thing. And then we're going to check in next week. I'm going to give you that same challenge to do one more thing. And then step by step together, all of us are going to build the apps that we want. So do that and have a good week.